Michael, please meet yourself. In preparation for this space, um, I was just going back, looking on the history of comments from Yellen and Powell and all the rest. I mean, here's a gang that couldn't have been more wrong. This is a crowd that told you it was transit that, that it was transitory. And earlier this year, they kept saying, "Well, it's peaking." Like, why would you listen to these people? With their staff of 400 Fed PhDs. When Jerome Powell is right, it's by luck. It's like when you go to the boardwalk at the Jersey Shore and, you know, you got the carnival barkers and the thing, the wheel spins around. Once in a while it comes up. Man, he'll be right. Otherwise, I think people have just, you know, slavishly follow the Fed, begging for more liquidity. That's the one thing they're not going to get. I mean, look, if you want to get into an argument, we're in a recession, we're not in a recession. To me, that's not really the issue. Yeah, some parts of the economy are slowing a lot, and probably we are in a recession. Maybe we're not. Some parts of the economy are doing extremely strong. They're doing extremely well. I can tell you this, wage gains are still accelerating. Maybe that'll change. But what's really relevant here, it's not trying to win the IQ contest. Oh, the recession started in January. Oh, it's starting now. Oh, it's not going to be as Ed Hyman says till the fourth quarter. That's not the point. We're here to try to make money, to figure out what's going to happen to asset prices. I don't care about definitions. All I care about is making money and trying to figure out, you know, whether the market's going to go up or going to go down. And, and, and this, 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 this attempt to win the IQ contest and redefine things, no, it's not a recession. It's a technical recession. And now all the talking heads of bubble vision, they're, they're very careful to insert the word technical before the word recession. This is complete insanity. If inflation probably is peaking, fine. But, you know, you look at the owner's equivalent rent data, you look at the housing data, the, 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 the um, wage data, Two of the biggest drivers of CPI and inflation. The only, the only signs of more rolling over in a really strong way. So the issue isn't whether it peaked last month, next month, three months before, or whether the recession started in January, it's starting now or in the fourth quarter. People need to look ahead. And okay, maybe, you know, we're done with the peak rate increases. Okay, fine. Michael has a lot of strong views about that. That's fine. But the only reason that would be the case, you know, for getting a recession, what that implies for earnings and given where valuations are, it's still checkmate if you're talking about the stock market. This has been the everything bubble. Stocks are not cheap. We look at the Buffett, Buffett indicator, you know, price to sales, Look at profit margins. You know, we've had this enormous secular shift over the last few decades. Returns on uh, labor have, 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 have shifted to returns on capital. We know all the reasons. But that game has stopped. And so to me, it's not, you know, where let's look at the video replay, instant replay. You know, where exactly, you know, we can, you know, the MBR is going to come out next year. And we're all going to agree that they're going to opine that the recession started in such and such date. That is a fool's errand. Hit the mute button on the Cartoon Network. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. What's relevant is what's happening to profits, what's happening to growth, and what's going to happen to valuations. And valuation is driven by a couple of components, not just the risk-free rate, but also credit spreads. And if we're just entering the down cycle, we've got a long ways to go, boys and girls, before we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. The brilliant Michael Kantritz, who's a, who's a friend of this room, I hope he comes in here today, is as eloquently as any, he's the best strategist in the street, in my opinion, has eloquently laid out the case for why it's too early to think about a turn maybe the second quarter of next year. But people just, they want their excess liquidity. Kathy's dying with that excess liquidity. And I guarantee you one thing, she ain't getting it. She ain't getting it. And all this up and to the right nonsense, which is a function of endless quantities of more money being sprayed all over the system. That game is over. Over. You know, you heard me say for many months, FOMO is dead. You know, Tina is dead. Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. 
Well, FOMO seems to have come back out of the grave the last couple of weeks. I, I forget what movie it is, Michael. You probably know it. But the one, you know, the one where the hand comes up through the ground and it's like, oh, my God, he's alive. It's alive. It's alive. OK, well, you look at this HKD thing and I see my good friend Guy Adami's here. And Guy, I was listening to your uh, podcast uh, yesterday. You were t- think talking about the HKD or one of your guests were you know, some people confusing it. That might have been the Hong Kong dollar or something. I never heard of this thing. To the moon, Alice. My name's not Ralph Cramden. I mean, oops, they're doing it again. They're doing it again. So let the band play on. And, you know, look, hindsight's twenty twenty. Who knows? We try to get the big picture right. We've done a great job this year. Last few weeks, I didn't call this rally. A lot of people got, you know, increasingly got short, shorter in the hole. You see no more motivated a buyer of a stock with someone who's, than someone who's short. Trust me, I've been there. I've starred in that movie. So I think it has to do as much with positioning and people's interpretation of what the Fed said or didn't say than it does with any, you know, real changes in fundamentals. But, you know, we don't want to win the IQ contest here. We just want to preserve and, you know, increase our capital. So there's this endless attempt to ascribe meaning every day to every price gyration in the markets and for all of us who've been in these markets long enough you know that's not possible on any given day there's some economic actor actor out there some buyer or seller who's doing something for some disparate reason which is completely out of sync uh with with, with, with a, what you you or i might might be thinking and so people are trying to you know i was reading this one thing this morning i gotta i gotta find it here i started to read this one thing this morning this guy starts going to this long Essay about the Fed pivot and this and that and blah blah blah. And, you know, looking at the lens, looking at the world through the lens of pre-COVID, as if nothing has structurally changed in the world. And I just, I just wanted to shoot myself. I, I just, anyway, I got plenty more to say, um, and we'll get into it later. Um, most importantly, we're here to um, listen to the great Michael Belkin who's a uh, dear friend, Michael, I'm, I'm, okay, there you go, who's, who's a dear friend. Uh, I've been a client of Michael's for 30 some odd years. I think I was his first client. Um, he's had more than his fair share of uh, outsized, you know, out of consensus calls. And, you know, it's just, it's just, I, I can never, I continue, I never, I continue to be amazed by his calls. He doesn't follow a narrative. He's the real deal. He's a, you know, Cal Berkeley stats um, graduate major. And um, he's worked with the best at Solomon Brothers and, and the like. And he really knows his stuff. And, you know, if any of my Canadian oil friends are in these and in this room, and I call them friends, and I mean it really that they are friends. I just ask for a little bit of civility. You know, Michael was in here in mid-June and made a call on energy and on bonds, and he was right, and it was very out of consensus, and he was right as rain on both of them, and the, uh, you know, you get some right, you get some wrong, and sure, Michael's got his share of wrong calls, you know what I really like, <laughs> Michael will make a call, it's like three people throw tomatoes at me, you know, like on ARC, so ARC started, you know, everyone knows I've been ARC, we've been bearish on ARC for over a year now, from like 130 on down. And so, like, you know, a week or two ago, someone throws a tomato at me. Oh, Judge, you've been beer shit up. It's gone from 38 to 48. Oh, you're an idiot. <laughs> Where were you at 130? And so people pulled that stunt on Michael as well. So someone took a shot at you, Michael, the other day. Oh, you're doing a room on, you're doing a room on, on, on selling energy? Isn't that late? I'm like, dude, where were you on June 15th or whatever the date was of, the, of, of that room? So, Michael, I, I want to tell you something. We got 800 people in this room. Um, I've never seen anything like this. You're quite a phenomenon now. Um, there were over 1,500, don't let this go to your head. There were over 1,500 people pre-registered for this room. I've done maybe 60 of these spaces or thereabouts. The biggest number I can remember seeing was 800. You're at 1,500. You've broken the bank. So I don't know if it's because you're signaling personality or your great talents as a musician or the fact you've been so right on so many things, but... People came here to hear you, not to here to listen to you, not me. So, Michael, welcome, my friend. Good to see you. How's life out in Bainbridge Island, Washington? Take it away. Yeah, can you hear me? 
Yeah, we got you. Hey, welcome, Michael. How's life in How's life out in Bainbridge Island? Okay, my phone connection is pretty lame here, though. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Hope it doesn't. Keep... Right. Could, could, could I urge you one thing? If that is the case, do not move around the house while you're talking, because it's just gonna it's gonna invite trouble. Okay. Just try to stay stay in one place. All right. Okay. Unless it seems to be going out. I'm staying Oi. in one place though. So, anyways, um, let's yeah, you're, going, you're, you're if, going internet. Oh. How's that now? No, 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 Michael, no, no. no good, no okay. good. Nope, nope, nope. Okay, better, 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 better. That's fine. better, better, yeah, that, better. That's okay. better. That's better. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm. Okay, so I'm doing this uh, standing up instead of sitting down. Okay, hey, thank you so much for having me, George. Um, just to review what I do, so I have a forecasting model, time series analysis based on rates of change. Everything I do is based on the model forecast and. It's a very different discipline, um, systematic way of forecasting than other stuff that's out there that I've ever seen. So it gives direction, position, intensity in a 12-period forecast. <clears throat> it doesn't give you a level on something. It just tells you, is something going to go up, down, or neutral? Is it beginning, the middle, or the end of a move? And uh, how strong is the signal? That's what I do. Um, Developed the model based on my studies in the stat department in business school at UC Berkeley, refined it at Solomon Brothers, and I've been doing the Belkin Report for 30 years ever since I left Solomon in 1992. Okay, that's the background. Now, um, uh, let me see. Um, where do I start? Um, okay, let's talk about um, turning points. Now, uh, last time I was on, it's forecasting energy down, bonds up. Um, so let me give you some dates. Like what I try to do in the report, uh, yeah, I published the Belkin report and also Belkin Goldstock report, um, is really try to identify turning points. The model is looking, basically wants to buy things that are down and sell things that are up. Um, it's, you know, it stays long something during the move up and stays short things on the way down. And there are different cycles in different time frames. Uh, so similar to Fourier, where you're looking for inflection points, cyclical turning points. So, okay, that's the background. What has happened? Bonds, TLT, bottomed June 14th. That's two months ago. Uh, the TLT ETF was at 109 at the bottom. Now it's 116. Um, it's up 7% in two months. Um, I see that in the model forecast as a major inflection point, long-term inflection point. So I think the decline in bond prices, the rise in long-term interest rates is over. And of course that contradicts, that's not what the Fed wants at all. The Fed wants interest rates to rise, tighter financial conditions, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> but um, so that doesn't mean the Fed isn't going to keep raising interest rates, okay? They control the short end. What it does mean is that we're having this inversion in the yield curve it will probably continue and steepen. I added that in the uh, Belkin report about a month or so ago. It's now, what, 30, 40 basis points, 10-year minus 2-year negative. So basically, Fed's going to keep raising interest rates. The long end already sees a recession coming. That's my interpretation, uh, what I put on... Uh, so bonds are rallying, nothing massive. So 7% off the low. Um, my number one recommendation for investors in, I, I believe we're in a bear market. I'll get to that in a second in stocks. Continuing, this has been a bear market rally like several others that we've had along the way. Um, in bonds, however, I, I think, uh, you know, I highly recommend if you're going to be long something for a long-term move, buy TLT, number one recommendation, or long bonds, whatever you have, you know, 30-year um, bond future. Um, I'd like to reinforce that idea with the fact that there are huge, huge short positions, uh, spec short positions in the CFTC commitments of traders reports in the 30-year long bond, 10-year, five-year. Um, there's basically like 800,000 co contracts. So I think there's a potential for a major short squeeze I think the, the mental exercise is people are saying, oh, the Fed's raising interest rates, bonds have to sell off. But I mean, that's yesterday's story. That's looking in the rearview mirror. And the model was short bonds for a long time, you know, like 18 months or something. Bonds topped a long time ago. 
and they declined. Um, my global bond uh, index of bond futures made it all the way to the 200-month average, which is a really um, significant event. So bonds have, have had a long-term bear market. They've hit the downside target. Just to give you an idea, 200-month average, that's very rare. Gets, things don't get there very often. They get there at the bottom of bear markets. Um, you can go through that. It doesn't mean it's not a magical number or anything. But um, with the model forecast turning up, I, I, I like bonds, global bonds, U.S. bonds. Um, real contrarian signal, you know, not, most people are not really on board that. Some of my fixed income clients are. But, um, okay, that's number one. Okay, oil. Crude oil peaked June 8th. That's two months ago. Uh, using the USO ETF as a, uh, as a benchmark here, just for figuring percentage change. It peaked at 92 on June 8th. It's now 72, down 21% today. Um, XLE, that's the energy stock ETF, same exact thing, peaked June 8th, two months ago at 92, now it's 73, down 21%. So energy and energy stocks have declined um, 21%. And that's a real mm, snub to conventional thinking, right? So if you look at the earnings, the uh, energy stocks currently have the strongest earnings, Right in the S and P. If you go, if you look at earnings, X energy, they're declining. So if you're just looking at the headline numbers on energy, you say, "Oh, earnings are up. Let's buy energy stocks." Sorry, that was yesterday's story. And by the way, you're talking to somebody whose number one long position for like 18 months or something was energy stocks and energy. So just to put this in perspective, what happened? We had the the coronavirus panic. The market sold off. They added $9.5 trillion of stimulus. That's $5 trillion of fiscal stimulus, $4.5 trillion of monetary stimulus, Fed balance sheet expansion. That's so unprecedented. There's like, it, it outranks anything ever in the history of insane stimulus. So they thought the world was going to end. And this is beyond Y2K. Remember Y2K, 1999, Greenspan boosted the, boosted the Fed's balance sheet because he thought the world was going to end. Um, and, uh, anyways, um, huge stimulus, and now it's over. No more fiscal stimulus. There's still a little dribs and, dribs and drabs here and there, but um, it's, no, it's over. And what did it do? It created inflation. And um, so all the things, and these were, you know, Belkin Report was long commodities, long crude oil, long grains, uh, long softs, all these things for about 18 months there. Now those are all shorts. Um, they bounced back. I'll give you an idea. That's the um, base metals ETF. That uh, is down about 20 something percent. Uh, it's bounced back a little bit. Um, zinc was up in the last few days. But base metals, copper, economically sensitive stuff, grains down big. So all the stuff that was goosed up by stimulus. And, uh, you know, remember shortages of this, shortages of that, and blah, blah, blah. Um, it's all kind of turned around. So now there's inventories, there's excess inventories. It's not insane, insanely overdone yet, but the prices of all this stuff have been falling. Okay, so that's, uh, I think, um, let me extend that. There's a couple other turning points I want to talk about in a second, but let's just talk about earnings. So this week's report, Belkin Report, the chart on the front page, which is also posted on Twitter, FANG average earnings Q2 down 10.1%. Um, that's EPS. If you don't believe me, go download EPS from any Reuters database source or anybody that does it. <clears throat> they're, they're down. The only one that was up was Microsoft, 0.5%. All the others were down sequentially. Okay, so this is sequentially, not year over year. Um, so earnings starting to fade. And these are the biggest cap stocks, right? Um, that people have been buying on the assumption that, uh, uh, you know, everything's oh, great, oh, bonds are rallying. Well, I, I'll talk about the psychology in a second. The, the rally in bonds is a boomerang into psychology. So I think the algos and automatic traders saw that and said, oh, good. 
In long-term interest rates are falling. That makes long-term investments like tech more valuable. So I have to buy FANG stocks and cloud software stocks. I mean, that's the kind of thinking that's going on. Um, I think uh, going into a recession, that's exactly the wrong thing to be thinking. Um, so the psychology to me is, what shall I say, deviant. It's just wrong for going into a recession. I, my model forecast for GDP, real GDP growth points down and for corporate earnings points down. And my number, um, remember I said the 200 month average for bonds, which I've already got there in the, two, in the average global index of bond futures and also um, 30 year yield has hit the 200 month average from below. Anyways, that number for stocks is down tremendously a lot. So S&P, 200 month average down 50%. NASDAQ 100, 200 month average down 61%. Okay, so that's downside risk in the stock market, long-term, not tomorrow, not this afternoon, not you know next week, but for this bear market that started in the, at the beginning of the year, actually last November for the NASDAQ, um, before it to have a typical retracement, all the way, like bonds have already had. I mean, this is not Alex Jones stuff. This is not crazy, you know, um, conspiracy theory. This is just standard what things do in recessions. Bonds have already had that. Stocks down 50%, NASDAQ down 60%. Um, over a period of 12 to 18 months. That's my, that's my forecast. So what do you do? Um, I think this has been a bear market rally. Uh, like I said, bonds are rallying. So people have rotated back into tech because they think tech earnings are going to be worth more because interest rates, long-term interest rates are declining. I think that's really messed up psychology. So what's, what, in a recession, earnings decline. Like I said, my earnings forecast for S&P earnings is sounds so ridiculous. Um, I'd probably get you know kicked off of Alex Jones or something, Infowars, for saying it. Hundred bucks, one oh seven for the S and P five hundred. That's my forecast. Twelve to eighteen months out. It's currently about two twenty five. Even the most bearish, like Morgan Stanley, who I'm on the same page with on a lot of stuff, Mike Wilson there. Um, he's still looking for two hundred something uh, S and P earnings. I'm looking. You know, I mean, it takes a long time for the full uh for the annual sum of earnings to start turning down take some quarters so it's not going to happen overnight but um basically earnings are falling um uh and i think 12 to 18 months out earnings could have just like the stock market could have so stocks follow earnings earnings go down in recessions stocks go down in recessions okay enough said there let's talk about some other turning points so this is fresh stuff so by the way i run a gold stock newsletter Belkin Gold Stock Forecast. It's affordable. It's more for retail investors. And um, in that Gold Stock newsletter, comes out every two weeks. It's biweekly. I've been practically begging everybody, don't invest in gold stocks. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I've got to be the only uh, Gold Stock newsletter out there saying, don't buy gold stocks. Uh, if you've been getting it, you know, I hope you listened because the GDX fell by 40%. Okay, I peaked in, I think, April. Um, I'm standing in my hallway, so I can't see in front of my computer. But uh, uh, <clears throat> GDX fell by 40%. Now, I think it bottomed on July 25th. Okay, here we are, August 5th. Um, two weeks ago, GDX, I, my, my work is changing. Uh, so we're, it bottomed at 2459. That's GDX gold stock ETF. It's up about 5%. It's now 26. Uh, gold, physical gold, bottomed on July 20th, potentially, two weeks ago, uh, in the, using the GLD for uh, a proxy for physical gold. That it was at 158 at the low. It's now 165, up 5%. So both gold and gold stocks have rallied about 5%. And the bottom, I think, we hit a major inflection point two weeks ago. Now let's talk about the dollar. DXY index. Now, I've been a little premature on this one. I, uh, I thought it would top earlier than um, I now it looks like it's really begin, even though it's up on the day. I believe the top in DXY is potentially July 14th, which was three weeks ago. 
Uh, so in the dollar index DXY, that was 108.68. Now it's 106.75, not down much, down 2%. Now these are favorite CTA, commodity trading advisor positions, long dollar, short bonds, um, you know. And so I think there's a major potential for the dollar to get squeezed down by liquidation of long positions. So, um, it, and I, I'm not just throwing these out randomly. It's fitting together in a scenario here. So notice dollar top, gold bottom. Um, so I think that's uh, real significant. And I don't think it's going to be straight off to the races. It'll probably be really messy. And I do not recommend um, selling the dollar in the hole when it's down or buying gold or gold stocks when they're up. Because there's still a lot of... Um, uh, shall we say, opposition. There's people on the other side of this trade, people that do not want gold to rally, people that are shorting gold stocks um, based on the way they trade. So I would accumulate, what I'm saying is, we probably hit a low um, in gold and gold stocks a couple weeks ago by the dips. Like we're having a dip today, good time to buy. Look, buy the pullbacks, um, gold. So that's a new uh, potential. And I have... Um, I, in the gold stock newsletter, I have a bunch of gold stock picks. I won't get into too many of them here, but if you look at these, Hecla had a huge move yesterday, HL, things like that. Another one, CDE, Core Mining. Um, these are kind of stocks that are really out of favor, really in the, in the basement, okay? And um, as John Templeton used to say, the time to buy is at the point of maximum pessimism. And the time to sell is at the point of maximum optimism. So I think we kind of hit that in gold stocks. Again, I don't think it's going straight up. Uh, it's just a question of buying the dips. Um, let me see. Inflation. So, uh, okay, now jobs. Let's talk about jobs. I just ran the numbers. So the new the jobs report came out today. Looks real strong. Um, now, I'm going to try walking to my computer because I want to read you a quote. Tell, if I start dropping out, tell me. Um, okay, here's uh, Chicago Federal Reserve. Quote, our two goals of price stability and maximum sustainable employment are known collectively as the dual mandate. In other words, the Fed has been charged with Congress to provide price stability and maximum employment. Okay, here's the definition in, from Investopedia of lagging indicators. The unemployment rate is one of the most reliable lagging indicators. The Consumer Price Index, which measures changes in the inflation rate, is another closely watched lagging indicator. So let's think about the implications of that. Yeah, the jobs report is looks great today. Who knows about those numbers, if they're real or not. There's a lot, all kinds of funny little things that go into the calculation, seasonal adjustments, et cetera. Um, and the civilian report was not up nearly as much. However, um, and by the way, initial unemployment claims have been inching up steadily week by week, almost, you know, two steps forward, one step back. So, um, but think about it. The Fed is focused on lagging economic indicators. That is a critical thing to keep in mind. Okay, so because the leading indicators number one is the stock market. You know, the stock market is down 20, 30%, depending on what index you're looking at. Even, you know, it's bounced back some. But um, uh, other, like retail sales, um, PM, uh, purchasing management indexes, those are all showing extreme weakness. So the leading indicators of our, suggest we're moving into a recession. The lagging indicators, which the Fed is charged by Congress with responding to, still look strong. So that's another idea that the Fed is going to be having tight credit conditions, raising interest rates as the economy goes down the tubes. So <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know, watching Powell's press conference, I always crack up. Um, he's kind of got the, the cat in the hat grimace on his face, you know, and and he says, well, job openings are so many, are so much above where they should be. We need to reduce some of those job openings, blah, 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 blah. You know, and he goes on and on. And um, so, again, it's a lagging indicator. So it, this is, you know, it's like a, it's a movie show or something. It's like, a, you know, what's going on? The Fed is so 
out to lunch about where, where the economy is headed. And like you said, three to 400 um, uh, PhD economists, they hire all these PhDs out of business schools and economic, you know, uh, economics programs. None of those guys apparently uh, predicted the rise in inflation which all the stimulus created. It was so obvious, and like that with all their models and training and everything, who said? The, so w the, one of the best um, questions, if you watch the press conference, go back and get the uh, the, the video of it. Uh, a guy from CNBC actually asked Powell. He said something to the extent, "This is a my from memory." So something like, "Well, you were so completely wrong on inflation. You kept encouraged. You kept telling us inflation wasn't a problem last year." Why should you? Why should we believe you now when you say that there's no risk of a recession? And Powell just kind of grimaced and said, "Well, I want monetary policy." You know, he goes on and on. So, anyways, that was a great moment in sports history, right there in the last. Uh, why believe the Fed when when they were so wrong on inflation? Now they're saying the same thing about a recession. So, enough said there. Um, let me see, inflation. I'll just give you some highlights from recent Belkin reports. So the retail sales report a couple of weeks ago was up 1%. Headlines everywhere. CNBC economy is so strong, blah, blah, blah. Real retail sales were down 0.3%. So basically inflation, it's just counting inflation, retail sales up 1%. Um, if real, you know, if you subtract inflation from that, the places aren't selling, stores aren't selling more stuff. They're just raising prices, basically, you know, and it's hurting the consumer. So um, that's a key view into what's going on in the economy. Same thing with real GDP. Real GDP is down, reported down last week, 0.9% at an annual rate. Nominal GDP was up a lot. It's all inflation. So inflation is eating the lunch of the economic recovery. Um, and uh, gradually, I think the nominal stuff, uh, my model shows CPI, PPI, all that stuff peaking, rate of change, not falling a lot yet. You know, it's not like the, there are some price rises built into the system, particularly in services and things like that. They'll keep getting handed through. <clears throat> but like I already pointed out, oil is down, grains are down, base metals are down. The things that fed the PPI uh, producer price index uh, rise, those are all declining massively. Um, okay, now a couple more things. Uh, I want to talk about sector rotation. Um, my long-term forecast for sector outperformance, uh, that's monthly data using a 12-month forecast. It's all the most defensive stuff. Utilities, consumer staples, and healthcare. Those are the only sectors, um, official S&P sectors, that have a long-term outperform forecast. They've been underperforming, of course, in this bounce back bear market rally recently. Um, but however, if you want, if you're a prof you know, professional portfolio manager, uh, I strongly recommend you um, get out of tech which has a long-term downward underperformed forecast, consumer discretionary, communications services, financials, um, and industrials and materials also to a lesser extent. But um, so basically the glory kind of stuff that people are buying, you know, tech stocks, got to buy FANG. Uh, the, and I, I already pointed out earnings per share down 10% sequentially in FANG. It, that went, nobody noticed that. I'm, I got to be the only one that's basically even mentioned that. I didn't see that mentioned anywhere in any uh, any kind of news reports anywhere. That is the stuff you should be um, selling into strength and shorting. Okay, I know it's been painful. This has not been a fun, you know, July, the market was up 8% as much as it was down in June. So that, it, we had a sharp down move in June, back up in July. And now we're kind of flat in August, tried to rally it, and we're up a little, down a little. We're slightly up, but I don't think it's going to keep going up. I, 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 by the way, short-term stuff, which I don't publish, but I look at very closely for timing, um, the, the entrance and mo moves. It's not as reliable, but anyways, it's really overdone to the upside in the stock market. So this daily rally, you still got people pushing, 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 trying to, you know, um, 
in retail investors uh, have been big buyers of tech stocks over the last month or so. You're seeing stories like that. Um, I would say unload into their pockets and short. So, um, you know, Fang is still a favorite short for me. Tesla, which has been, oh, that one's been painful. But it's only up to the 200-day average. Look at a chart of, of Tesla, TSLA. 50% move off the bottom. Impossible to stay short through. This one's a real uh, widow widow maker shorting Tesla. Um, I still like it as a short. Uh, it's all it's done is, is have a bear market rally, as intense as it has been. Um, and by the way, uh, we're we're going to we're mo thinking about moving into selling uh, Belkin voodoo dolls on the on the uh, on the website. So when something goes wrong, if you feel if you're feeling uh, pain, you can stick pins in the Belkin voodoo doll, and I can feel the the pain in my spleen, you know, from things like rallies in Tesla. But anyways, Tesla still remains a, a short. I think it's going down. Um, sector rotation is garbled. And uh, let me, um, I'd like to talk a couple other things. Market psychology. Okay, I mentioned it before, but I think the psychology is completely wrong. Um, uh, basically, uh, again, longer term interest rates falling due to economic weakness and a recession. It's bad for earnings. It's bad for the stock market. That is not in um, market psychology at all yet. So I'm looking for a profound shift in market psychology, similar to what happened in 1987. If you remember in 87, the Dow rallied. I was early in Solomon in those days. I remember seeing the bond sell off and the stock market rally for quite a while. And uh, then all of a sudden, boom, it changed. So bonds rallied and stocks collapsed. Um, so I think uh, similar, I'm not saying it's going to be like an 87 crash. It could be, I don't know. I'm not predicting it. But uh, basically, the psychology that changed that happened there, where a, a major investors did an asset allocation shift out of stocks into bonds. I think we're going to have a major move like that in psychology. So the psychology is going to change in the market. Um, that's what I'm looking for. Let's talk about China. Now, are you still hearing me there? I want to make sure I'm still good. Enough. You still hearing me? Yeah, Mike. Yeah, guys, yeah keep going. We're good. Okay. We're good. Keep going. Okay, I just want to make sure I'm... I'm Coming yeah, through, yeah. we we connection here. Okay, let's say China. Uh, I turned uh, the model about three weeks ago. Added China as a short. Um, now you think uh, what has happened? Investors re went back into China about two three months ago. Uh, there was all these big inflows into Hong Kong, uh, Ali, you know, U.S. listed stocks, Alibaba, uh, Baidu, things like that. Okay, now, of course, we have Taiwan, China, you know, everything that's going on there. And I'm no geopolitical expert, but um, the, I think, uh, I, you know, before this thing transpired with uh, Pelosi making her, her trip there and, you know, speaking to their parliament and everything, um, the model turned bearish on Chinese equities. So um, I have China as a short. Now, it's down a lot, okay? Um, it's, all, you know, it's not like we're shorting something that's way up. It's not selling high. But um, uh, we have a number of events conspiring. Um, I, I I'm see the Chinese economy imploding. Now, I know they've come out with a bailout program for these property developers, but mortgage, you know, they sell these condominiums, apartments without building them. People, Chinese people buy them and they're paying these mortgages on these things that they aren't built yet. So now they're basically boycotting paying mortgage uh, you know, payments on these things. The, um, the, the suppliers to the developers are not providing supplies anymore. So this whole thing is going into like freeze mode. Um, uh, and I would not underestimate uh, how, how uh, what, what a big problem this is, you know. And also the other thing, fundamental thing is, you know, Gensler, SEC commissioner, commissioner is saying, um, Chinese stocks are going to be delisted. Either you open your books, which they're refusing to do, or you're going to get kicked off, kicked off the exchanges. And there's a deadline approaching for that. So I think, um, and then we think about the potential for conflict. So what, you know, thankfully we don't have nuclear war or anything yet, you know, over in Taiwan. However, just think about where this is headed. It reminds me a little bit of, of the way 
the Russia Ukraine thing developed. And I remember having, um, you know, I have conference calls with clients all over the world, family offices, big investors, you know, huge institutions. And before, when Russia was, um, you know, massing on the Ukraine border, I couldn't find a single person. And these are clients in Europe too, who are like right with their faces up next to it. Everybody said, oh, no, it's just a bluff. They're not going to do anything. You know, they're just posturing. They want to get a better deal. And still, I mean, even still, I talk to the same people. And a lot of them are saying, oh, well, they're going to stop pretty soon. They're just going to get a bit. It's going to be a peace deal. And I mean, so it, obviously that's not what happened. Russia rolled in. It affected markets. It affected geo, the geopolitical situation. Now, I think something similar it may be taking shape vaguely similar with the China-Taiwan thing. And if you notice, what happened is, if you owned Russian equities when this thing hit, it wasn't the Russian invasion that hurt you, it was the sanctions, okay? So you put these sanctions on, you couldn't even own these things anymore, and you couldn't even sell them. After, I mean, if you didn't dump them right away, there was no market. So, you, I mean, try getting a market for Gazprom or something, you know? It's like... Nobody, the brokers will look at you, you know, saying, well, we can't do that. You're sanctions. So um, what I'm leading up to is here is the people who own Chinese stocks, and there are stories about this. I'm not the only one saying this. Um, you might be left holding a hot potato here. You know, if this thing keeps moving forward on a slow boil, if they blockade, keep blockading, and it turns into, you know, you know, gradual slow burn confrontation. The next, you know, these politicians, the only thing they know how to do is put sanctions on. And then, you know, so I'll, long story short, look out for Chinese stocks. China is a short to me, even though it's down so much. Um, FXI, ETF, short. Ba Alibaba, Baidu, all those things, shorts. Um, okay, a couple more points. That affects uh, EM too, obviously, emerging markets. So um, I'm not a fan of emerging markets. I cover them very closely. Um, I will say I have two long recommendations. Are you ready for this? In, emer in frontier markets, um, da -da 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 -da, Sri Lanka <laughs> and Kenya, these are both crushed. Okay, now again, Templeton, buy at the point of maximum pessimism. Sri Lanka looks like a total disaster. Um, I told this, Mark Farber is a friend of mine, and you know, I sent this to him. This sounds like you, Mark. You know, you, he, he told me, I, you know, I've, I've had, you know, drinks and dinners and things with him when, in Hong Kong when I'd been over there. And he was, he was the kind of guy that would go into Taiwan before it was even legal to buy stocks there and, you know, buy share certificates and sneak them out in his briefcase. Um, but anyways, Sri Lanka down enormously. Looks like a disaster, end of the world. It's a buy. I don't know if you figure out what to buy there. There's not a lot of stocks. But just if you're an EM or money manager, international money manager, I'd sniff around. It's still pretty close to the lows. And the other one is Kenya. Same thing. Kenya, real major collapse. Not quite as big as Sri Lanka. And there's obviously political problems and economic problems in those places. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm struggling to find long ideas. Those are the only sort of you know, negatively correlated things that I can find. Um, Couple more points. Uh, da, 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 um, question. I guess I think that's pretty much it. So I think um, just to summarize, um, we've hit. I'm looking. The model gives this forecast of direction, position, intensity. Um, things are changing. The Belkin report is not a broken clock. It doesn't always keep saying the same thing, you know. So I was long energy stocks and energy, my previous favorite longs last year, now my favorite shorts. Uh, at top in oil, June 8th in energy stocks, two months ago. Already down 20%, headed probably a lot lower. Gold and GDX, gold stocks, bottom, potentially July. It's only two weeks ago, July 20th, July 25th. July 20th for gold, 25th for GDX. Uh, up 5%, still real close to the lows. Those are a buy to me. Um, fits in with the dollar top emerging. Ju July 14th, DXY, three weeks ago. It's only down 2%, so nothing big. So dollars are short, gold's are long. Gold stocks are a buy, but don't chase them. You know, there are still enemies of gold out there that want to smash it down. Take advantage of that. Take advantage of the smashes when they smash gold. 
um, and uh, accumulate stocks. And again, I have the gold stock report, covers every investable gold stock in the world. If you're interested in the gold space, it's a good place to start looking for long ideas there. And uh, bonds, major thing, bonds. Uh, bottom June 14th, two months ago, my number one long position, TLT, buy them. Michael, that is just phenomenal. Uh, what a tour de force. So um, I'd like to get some people in here, ask some questions, but just to, you and I know each other uh, so well and for so long. Uh, just listening to you speak and looking at the uh, this week's Belkin Report, um, just for the audience so they understand, but just summarizing what you were saying, as I look at Michael, your report, just to confirm, you've got the the, the, the the energy stocks. You've got oil and gas, energy service, coal, metals and mining, agriculture. You have all the commodities, so broadly speaking, those are your highest conviction uh, shorts. And your um, relative list, the things you like the best, are defensive. So personal products, beverages, food products, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a very risk-on type of uh, outlook on the basis of your uh, sector selection. Question I'd like to ask you, Michael, and is uh, just to delve in a little deeper, as you said at the top, um, the way your uh, work uh, functions, it's it's not just a question of direction, but also intensity and duration. And so, could you just review a little bit? Because I, I I know like not all signals are equal. Some are have stronger intensity than others. Some are earlier than others. So, could you just speak to, you know, the signal strength and where we are? in terms of time with your sort of bearish view? I mean, you know, you know, I've been in a lot of communication the last few months. My sense is this is the intensity is very high for you, Stone. This is not sort of a middle-of-the-road call. You feel very convicted on, on this. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, it's risk-off move on the sector rotation, not risk-on. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I misspoke. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Really okay, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, um, so, yeah, that this is one of those times – where the long-term signals are the most important thing. So the sig different signals set up differently in different time frames. Um, the monthly data shows a major cycle inflection point um, starting at the beginning of the year. So here we are seven, eight months into a move and um, we're about a third of the way in the downward move according to um, direction, position, intensity. It's, it, you can't get any stronger. These are the strongest um, long-term signals. Uh, you know, it doesn't, just doesn't get any stronger. So it's as strong as it gets. Down for stocks. And now it's bottoming for bonds. So that's more of a fresh signal. So we're more like a third of the way down long-term in stocks, but there's no turning point in sight. Okay, so monthly data, the, the forward forecast horizon is 12 months. No turning point in sight. So next 12 months down. So that's why, you know, that increases my um, confidence in the fact that this is just a bear market rally that we've had, you know, in July, a little bit into August. Um, and, uh, okay, what else? Commodities, really strong down. So just starting, energy, crude oil, um, energy stocks down. So uh, direction down, intensity strong. It's, it, it's in both weekly and monthly. So um, that's a high confidence thing. Now, could this get, you know, sideswiped uh, by a war? Somebody attacks Iran, something? Yeah, maybe, but I, it just, I have to go with the model forecast. So those are the risks. That's the only risk to it. Something happens unforeseen out of left field. But it implies that the economy is headed down, and the signal for the economy is down, again, as strong as it gets. Corporate earnings... These, uh, let me just put this in perspective. The, the only comparable signals that I have when they're this strong are like in the peak, last cycle peak, major one was 2007, right? So you had the, you had the credit boom, housing boom, you know, all of that, Bernanke, and then everything started to go south. It's, this is different. This isn't exactly like that. But the, the forecast for the market going down and earnings going down, only comparable to that or early like 2000. So this is a major cycle uh, to inflection point, similar to early 2000, 
or 2007, leading up into the decline in the economy and the market in 2002, which bottomed, wasn't that big of an economic decline, but the market sure declined a lot, NASDAQ. Uh, and then, of course, everything went down together in 2008, 2009. So um, again, I'm not a perma bearer. I'd love to be bullish on something, but it's just not there in the forecast. So really high confidence, long-term down for the economy, markets, energy, um, yeah. yeah no, so, 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 yes, this is this is a really high conviction call on your part. It's across asset classes. It's a call. It's across different time frames, and so this is you know this is this is about as high as conviction as you get. Which to me, is serious information content, Matt. Because knowing you as long as I do, it's sort of like in sports. You know, you watch a player and you kind of you can read them and anticipate them. And when I hear you speak like this, you know, I've known you got thirty some odd years. Like it really, I mean, I was listening to you anyway, cause you're, 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 you're so spot on most of the time, but when you talk like this, it gives me the heebie jeebies. So, wow. That, that's really powerful stuff. So Michael, just hold there for one second. Let's go to a couple questions. Um, Hey, good. We got guy Adami here. My good friend guy Adami and we got KFAB. So guy, the floor is yours. And then KFAB, uh, you're on deck guy. Welcome. Well, I've enjoyed this immensely and I'm sorry that I have to ju jump for one o'clock, but I think it's, you're doing a, Tremendous service for people. I mean, it, it, extraordinarily uh, insightful, informative, and put out there in a very accessible way, which is really important, number one. And number two, the unfortunate reality is I pretty much agree with everything you said in terms of you know your forecasts and what you think for the market. I don't know necessarily if I'm as negative as you in terms of S&P 500 earnings. I think the numbers you put out are pretty dire, but I'm not going to argue with you because I think the estimates are way too high. And I think what we've seen since June 15th was somewhat predictable. I know Nancy did, Nancy's here. Uh, she said it on the halftime report, I think on June 16th, that she expected a bounce. We talked about it on Fast Money in our podcast. You know, I thought it was reasonable to think the S&P could you know, get up to 4,100, 4,200 on an overshoot. And here we are. But everything that I'm watching now signifies the next leg lower. And I will tell you, the, the volatility in the bond market, if it wasn't so tragic, it would be absolutely comical. The fact that two-year yields can move 20, 25 basis points in the course of hours to me speaks to how the central bank has lost control. And the bull case for gold here, I think, lines up if the Fed, do, if the Fed in fact does pivot for whatever reason, which would be a mistake, I think that's going to open the floodgates for gold. And if the Fed loses control of the narrative or the situation, which I think is also a, a very strong potential case, I think it's bullish for gold. So, for the, And I'm not one of these tinfoil wearing gold people by any stretch, but I definitely understand how it works in this environment. So thanks, George, for having me on. I'll, I'll listen, but then I got to hop. But thank you so no, much. I, I appreciate it, Guy. You're always welcome here. Always enjoy your comments. That, that's awesome. And I got it. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Thank you, Guy. Uh, KFAB, uh, you're up. And then Henry. KFAB, welcome. What's going on, my friend? Hey, George. Thanks. Uh, hey, Michael. Pleasure to uh, be speaking with you again. Um, I had a quick comment and then a question. The comment was uh, relative to your bullishness on TLT. Uh, for the, the volatility junkies out there, there's a zero coupon long duration ETF, uh, ZROZ run by PIMCO. It's basically the equivalent of TLT only juiced up because it's zero coupon. So that's like that's usually even more volatile uh, if someone's looking to capture upside in, in, uh, in long duration. Um, my, my question, and again, looking for other things for people to maybe diversify into that's not short, because uh, you know George gets a lot of people that aren't uh, you know professional money managers. What what does your model look like? Because I, your your comments on the frontier markets piqued my interest. Um, what what's your model looking like on local currency emerging market debt? Because that stuff's been obliterated too. They've been tightening a lot of those central banks for two years now. Uh, so something like EMLC is an ETF where you know they're down sixty percent in in uh, dollar terms and you know your talk on the dot you know the confluence of your setup with the dollar index gold silver that leads me to believe that maybe your model is setting up for um local currency emerging market debt thank you uh good question so um <clears throat> let me think the best way i could answer that is uh, i follow uh 10-year global bond yields government bond yields in every every major market and as well as most emerging markets, anything that has a liquid 
uh, 10-year government bond yield. And almost all of those uh, show a peak. So I have a peak in global yields, right, H happening at the same time. Um, and I, I, so in terms of spreads, I'm not a fan of emerging markets. So I don't think, um, yeah, they could rally. And yeah, yields are probably peaking at pretty much everywhere. And if you, if you want to lock in some yields on some of these, and these are government debts too, so it's not like they're not, um, you're not talking, you know, property developer debts or something. But if you can, uh, I, do, I do think there's a global interest rate peak or bottom in bond prices. However, I don't like the spreads. And one of the things that could help treasuries is a move out of riskier bonds, not so much emerging market debt, but more junk. So I do not like junk bonds, okay? Yeah, they can bounce a little bit now and then have these bear market rallies. But um, the other side of junk bonds selling off, as we saw in 2008, 2009, is treasuries rally. So, if you know, it's a flight to safety. So out of junkier stuff into, you know, quote unquote, the risk-free asset. So I like treasuries as a, um, as a counterpart, you know, to riskier debt and that would include emerging market power i mean out of spread however we think um emerging yields are probably popping for the most part not everywhere you lose me hello yeah michael i don't know if you you heard us or not but the last 30 seconds or so i don't know if you're moving around but your signal got kind of messed up. So um, you were doing great until 30 seconds ago. Um, KFAB, thanks for the question. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting question. Henry, uh, the floor is yours, and then Gnostic. Henry, welcome. Good to see thanks. you. Thanks, thanks, George. I appreciate it. I uh, I didn't necessarily have a question originally. I just saw you invited me up to uh, to speak, but uh, but I uh, I appreciate kind of the thoughts, uh, Michael. And I, I guess you know I I heard what you were saying about gold. It's interesting, you know, as I look around, uh, it feels as if, though, we're in a bit of the eye of the storm here, um, you know, whether it's kind of the moves in certain speculative equities, uh, risk off on economically sensitive information, you know, kind of tightening into uh, this environment that you, you spoke to. We haven't yet had that correlations go to one moment. Um, I don't know if we're going to get it. I don't know if you've spoken into it uh but i guess you know how you how you weigh the probabilities or think about that over the the coming kind of months or in this environment uh and i assume it's it's you know on the back of that and any possible yield curve control when that happens that's when you're you're constructive gold or you're saying even here and now it's something you're watching thanks okay um yeah okay correlations to one um now gold uh, it, it fades in and out, but the correlation gold is typically negatively correlated to the stock market. It hasn't been lately. It's been going down w with stocks, but actually as stocks have been going up, it's even been going down. Um, but I do see gold as a potentially negatively correlated in what happens next. So gold could outperform silver. By the way, I didn't even talk about silver. Um, silver even more so. Silver, it, it fell more than gold. Um, and I have both turning up and um, silver stocks, which I follow closely, and of which there's only about 25 or 30 investable silver stocks in the world. And they're not, they're, I mean, there are very few pure plays. The, the best pure plays, Fresnillo, trades in London, it had came out with horrible earnings, you know, yesterday's stock crashed. But I, I think those are uh, what I'm seeing in the gold stocks is kind of end capitulation at the end. So Newmont came out with horrible earnings last week, week before stock went down eight, ten percent. Um, I'm, I'm I'm not a I'm not a fan of Newmont stock. There are other stocks that I like better in the gold space, but um, I I don't necessarily think everything's going to move up and down together. That's why I think, particularly bonds. So again, bonds could rally. Treasury bonds with the stock market going down. And that is not in the psychology, as I talked about before. That's not what people are thinking. They're thinking, oh good, bonds are rallying, buy tech stocks. Okay, I think that's really messed up, dysfunctional thinking, psychology. So it's always dangerous to say 
the market's wrong, right? You know, you, you, usually when you say that, it means you're wrong. <laughs> the market's right, and you're right. trying to make reason for, for being wrong. However, I, I think what I'm predicting is, based on what I'm seeing in the model forecast, bonds could rally, stocks decline, and that's not in the psychology. So the psychology, the, what people are thinking, and I don't know how you tell Alves who've been programmed to think one way by, you know, people who've only been in eight years in the market have never seen anything other than what's happened. You know, they're not, they don't even have the 2009, 2008 um, experience in the algos programming. But anyways, so yeah, I think bonds could rally and potentially gold. And this is early days, you know, so it's still probably going to be messy on gold. But uh, other than that, you know, I, that's, um, uh, so one other quick answer to your question. Um, so the defensive stuff that I have long-term outperform forecast for, it doesn't have an upward f absolute forecast. So I look at everything relative absolute. So if you're, uh, a lot of my clients are um, long only portfolio managers. I mean, I have everything across the gamut, hedge funds, um, family offices. A, a lot of people only care about absolute returns. But mm -hmm. when I tell them, you know, utilities are supposed to outperform, but they're not supposed to go up. <laughs> That's not very exciting, right? A, a, a family office says, well, I don't want to, who cares? But, yeah, but um, you know, Mike, so, you're, you're describing a world where flaps didn't go up. And, um, this kind of makes me wonder, not wonder, it's a leading question, obviously, but in a world where flat is new up and everyone's positioned the wrong way. I mean, don't you kind of think like the, the, what's blown, what's really surprised me is that the retail public, they just they haven't sold anything. I mean, you know, they put in over a trillion last year into the market. They've sold hardly anything. And then they get FOMO, you know, FOMI again. I mean, don't you find it uh, extraordinary? I mean, it's out the, the environment you're describing and now this is maybe not from your signals, but as you think about what your signals are saying, because you are a strategist, if you're right and the public hasn't really sold yet, and then you're a big watcher of hedge funds as well, and their redemptions are starting to pile up, I mean, don't you think it leads me to wonder, leading question, leads me to wonder that this could get really ugly. I mean, people, you know, they're still, the, Joe Retail, you know, is still saying, so you're, you know, so you're saying there's a chance, you know, and they're off to the races by AMC again, but don't you think we're on the, we're on the cusp of, you know, maybe massive liquidations from retail and hedge funds, Michael? Yeah, but um, the why do, they don't seem to get it. So, again, I think I, I see this insatiable bid, particularly the last few weeks from retail for techie kind of stocks, right? Fang stocks, things like that. Um, and... Uh, what is going to change these people's minds? I mean, the, with the market down, you know, NASDAQ down 20 something percent, they can't get it. I mean, they're, they're still want to buy the dip. It's like this insatiable demand to buy the dip. So um, I sadly, I think it's going to end in tears for them. And all I can do is do things like this on this Twitter space with you and say, if you're one of those people, I mean, <laughs> you better have some risk control or something. Because if the market is going to end up down 50 or 60% from here, you know, depending on the S&P or NASDAQ in a year or two, um, and some of these stocks you're buying are going to be down a lot more than the index. So, yeah, I think it's going to be not nice. And I think, um, you know, I think people are going to be hurt. Obviously, hedge funds, a lot of hedge funds are suffering, not all. But um, I think retail investors, that's the next place where um, the pain trade is going to be. Hey, Michael, um, I, don't, I don't want to get too granular, so maybe I'll use, you know, go back to the Japanese uh, market days, you know, so-called representative issue. So if we take the really speculative garbage, whether it's Carvana or uh, AMC or you, know, you pick your favorite mean stock or, or Teladoc or Kathy Woodstock, maybe let's just use one sort of you know, it could be Tesla, whatever. Let's use sort of one representative issue. Let's use ARK, ARKK, all right? Because sort of like if people know that you know, it's one of my favorite uh, things to bash on. Um, that sort of is one's been one stop shopping for all your unnecessary purchases, I'd like to say. So when you look, look at ARK, ARKK, I know you know it, just as sort of as a placeholder for representing, you know, speculative garbage. Uh, again, asking me, um, what does that look like to you? ARKK. Um, looks like it's being squeezed. If I so long-term forecast is still down. If you look at it, it, it's been acting. 
I mean, if you look at intraday trading, it seems to be acting great. But if you look at a daily chart, it hasn't really gone anywhere. You know, it's been like bouncing along the bottom with zigs and zags. So um, it's a, I think it was a crowded short. It was one of the highest shorted um, ETFs. It's probably, I haven't looked at it lately. Um, I, I bet you some of the shorts have been squeezed out of that. And a lot of those stocks that she owns, let's face it, I mean, they're not going to be around. If you, if you lived through the 2000 experience, um, you know, she has the equivalent of like Ask Jeeves. You remember Ask Jeeves? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How can I forget, Michael? <laughs> so Ask Jeeves ended up going down 90 something, you know, nine, and, and actually it ended up being a great buy at the bottom. And so maybe someday Kathy Woodstocks will be too after everybody who's you know, after she gets all the, I mean, she's still getting inflows, right? You know, like people still want to buy this stuff. So at the bottom, it's not going to look like that. So long-term forecast still down, probably some kind of squeeze going on that's kept it up. Um, it, it's not my favorite short. So again, energy, things that are up a lot that people own. I mean, I mean, I couldn't, I would try squeezing ankles, squeezing elbows to get people to buy energy stocks 18 months ago. Silence, deafening silence. Hey, Nothing. Hey, Michael, no. Michael, so just stay on that. I want to go to Javier right now. Um, I don't know if you know Javier. He's he's a friend, really smart guy. He actually trades the physical for a living, all commodities and energy. So, Javier, I think this is a perfect place for you to enter and and, and talk to Michael. Maybe ask him a few questions. Maybe first, just share your perspective of the physical markets, and then interplay that with what Michael's saying. So, Javier, the floor is yours. Please unmute yourself. Hey, George, your introductions are always too kind. Uh, thank you for, for, for saying that. I actually did not come up here to talk about energy. I, I'm, so I'll segue. I'll answer what you asked me to. But then I actually have a, I have a non-energy question for Michael. Michael, I love listening to you talk. I love hearing it. I, I'm all energy all the time. So um, I like to hear the other perspective. Uh, physical commodity-wise, obviously, we're seeing a definite retracement. Um, there's not... You know, there's this whole bull oil narrative that's out there, you know, on a long-term 10-year look. I absolutely agree with it. I don't think there's any question. We have a supply constraint problem, capital X, CapEx problem, um, whatever. We can, that, that's a whole different narrative. Um, Equity-wise, I think, I think my narrative has always been, even if there's a physical problem, oil and, and energy equities are, gonna, are really going to struggle, one, because of perspective, two, because they need somebody else to buy them. I agree 100%. I, I wouldn't touch an energy equity to save my life today. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put George's money in energy equities. Um, <laughs> you know, whatever. I, I, I wouldn't touch them. Um, physical wise, and and I, and I know Tom Tommy Thornton's here, and I, and I know he ran. He ran a really really nice chart, and I'm going to continue to watch this chart for energy. And it's the managed money long short. It continues to tank, right? I mean, there's still a mass exodus, a mass exodus of long across the energy. And not just energy, but across the commodity platform, period. The one, the, the, the one thing in the market that I believe actually has is fairly mispriced is the risk to agricultural commodity physical prices, right? So corn, wheat, beans in the U.S., um, it's in the ground. We're waiting on yield. They, the, the USDA has not made a yield adjustment yet, so a prediction of yield, but I can tell you Western acres are struggling. Um you know, if corn, so corn, we planted 89 million acres, planted 93 million last year, so we're down to 4 million total acres. Uh, estimated yield started off at about 174 an acre. I think they're going to come out with 170 an acre, 169 an acre. That's what their predictions are going to be. Um, from my understanding, I got guys in Western Nevada that aren't going to be able to corn in um, If we get 155, 160 an acre, for the average in corn this year, I will be pleasantly surprised. That tells me that these corn and forward forward corn wheat bean markets are significantly significantly underpriced, way more underpriced than any of the bull narratives in, in energy. So that's just my thought of the day. I think that's you know, and that's hard for it's hard for retail investors to have exposure to, um, you know, type those type of agricultural commodities, but. That's it. I'd be happy to answer any other questions. So I actually have, I have another question, and this one's completely off my normal topic, George, if you'll indulge me for one. In the last 10 days, I've heard two very smart people. So I've heard Stanley Druckenmiller and I've heard Michael Green both talk about the Fed and interest rates and where they think they either need to be 
or what they think they're going to do. And Michael Green surprised me a little bit. So he 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 had I mean, he actually had a little bit of a go at me, and I wish he was here because I'd like to hear Michael. He basically said that because they missed the the cue the cue ball on the break on inflation so badly that doing that to put itself out would be a, a very wise alternative, um, which kind of surprised me. Which, and I my my question was. You know, 75 points, 100 points, 150 points to week curtail, try to get a, a grasp on inflation early. And he said, no, nothing would be better than anything at this point. Kind of surprised me. Drunken Miller this week, he, he, he says that at any point in time in an inflationary environment like this in history, until the Fed funds rate was over CPI for a certain amount of time, particular caveat. Hey, Javier, you, Javier, 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 we're losing you. Sorry, we're losing you. Hello? Can you hear me? Okay. Am I there? Yeah. So, 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 okay. so, so, so hold on. So, hold on. So so wait, 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 yeah. wait, 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 wait. So Michael Green is saying they're going to do nothing or they should do nothing. Is that what he's saying? That we, that yeah. Mike Green is saying? He, he, he okay. said he should do nothing. Okay. And I, said, I'm, okay. I want to hear him say this. And then, and, and, and Drunken Miller said, in no point in time in an inflationary, inflationary market of this ever, as, there, as, as a Fed funds rate or a, and he, he went on to say some other different inflationary environments where whatever the, the, the front tax rate for rates was at the time needed to be over the whatever the implied CPI was for that economy. But in ours, he said, that funds rate must be over CPI. So this is extraordinarily different view um, where we are. So, so, Michael, modeling forward is to believe the market and sector rotation and the way the rates curve is working. One, Michael Green's view is that the Fed has, has missed it so badly they should let the market work itself out. I believe that the, the trade over the last sort of month is that, that same similar view, that the Fed is moderately done, they're going to do a little bit, they're going to back off. If Drunken Mill is right, and that's what they need to do, it makes your predictions, I believe, even look rosy. Where are you on the forward track of the Fed? Like, what, like, like where's your feel on this, and what do you think the market is fairly pricing? Michael, could you hear the question, Michael? We can't hear you, Michael. Please unmute yourself, Michael. Oh, boy. I think we lost Michael. Hey, Mark Newman, are you there, Mark Newman? Hi, George. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, hi. we're having problems here with... Uh... Okay, I'm back. Okay, There's yeah, Michael. all right. Yeah, 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 Michael, were you able to hear the question, Michael? Yeah, sorry about that. I, I'm having connection problems. I live on this... Okay. I live on the backside of an island here outside of Seattle, and the connections are right. pretty good. Okay, anyways, so w question is Fed. What's the Fed going to do? I'm, I'm usually a bad um, person to ask that because they're so stupid. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I can't, it's hard for me to think like them. <laughs> but um, I, I basically, every, at every inflection point, They've been completely wrong. So um, they've been, you know, they were tightening before the COVID hit. Then they, they said the dot plot lo looked up forever. And then they cut like crazy, you know, in no amount of time. At the bottom, then <clears throat> they said uh, over and over, we're, never got, we're not going to raise interest rates. Inflation is not a problem. We're going to have low rates forever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then... Look what happened. So now they're raising rates like crazy. So I just, if you ask me my hunch, I don't have any strong um, numerical quantitative uh, opinion for this. They'll probably keep raising a few more times. I th my prediction on the economy suggests, again, they're responding to lagging indicators. CPI and employment are the two most primary lagging indicators. So um, as long as inflation looks bad, we'll probably keep raising while the economy starts going down the tubes. So this is really, I think it's a desperate... Michael, we lost you again. Michael, you were doing great. The market should be setting interest rates. Let me say that, right? So if the market was setting interest rates, they would go up and down based on supply and demand. We don't have that. We have this 
you know, we have these apparatchiks, you know, like a Soviet Politburo who decide what the rate, proper rate should be. And we're thinking really hard about it. And we come to a consensus. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, hey, hey, come on. Hey, hey, Michael, 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 you please be Janet in the location, the one who said we're never going to have a financial crisis in our lifetimes. What does Janet have to say on this, Michael? Uh, well, what's she saying? Oh, no recession. <laughs> we're not. We're not in a recession, and there's no, not going to no, be a recession. No, no financial crisis, major crisis in our lifetime, right? Uh, it's, yeah, it's sad. Um, not only that, by the way, you can get booted or um, f f fact checked on Facebook for saying the economy's in a recession. Now, <laughs> they have fact checkers that kick people off for saying, "Oh no," because the White House says that two, two consecutive quarters of GDP declining are not a recession. So the, the, these fact checkers actually, I don't know where they get these people, but there's this narrative management out there to try to control everything. But back to the question, the Fed will probably keep raising a few more times. And the, uh, basically, I think they're going to get swamped by a major economic collapse. And then they will return. So that's probably what the dollar and gold are saying now they're sensing that potential for the fed being completely wrong and reversing policy at some point they obviously can't right now because inflation is high and employment looks strong and they're lagging indicators so but i think um as as data continues to come in i think uh earnings will continue to weaken the um retail sales will weaken the pmis are already um depending on how which measure you use are already below 50 and in GDP has been declining for two quarters, real GDP, um, not nominal GDP. So I think the Fed is absolutely wrong again, and we're not there yet. We'd we'll probably raise a few more times, and then all of a sudden, boom, sort of like a 2008 uh, economic slump hits, and they reverse course. Hey, Michael, one question I want to throw in here. It's come from a, from a, from a listener. This is good for ha – and Javier kind of touched on it. So long term, long term, in the long run, we're all dead. Longer term, Javier, of course, is acknowledging supply constraints. We'll have an energy problem, blah, blah, blah. But that's, you know, as Michael Guyot often says, it's all about, you know, path, not, not prediction. And, and, and cyclical, you're expecting energy to, you know, really take a dirt nap here. I get it. But when you look at much longer term, I don't know, not, you know, not 12 months or 12 quarters, but I don't know, maybe 12 years, whatever. Do you have any longer term forecasts on energy or is it's not relevant. It's just not what you do. Or, or you might say, yeah, maybe long term looks great. But, you know, right here, right now, forget about it. Because people still, you know, look at the fundamental narrative of we're supply constrained and eventually prices do have to go up and stay higher for longer. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, except in a recession is the most important thing. So go back and look what happened to the price of crude oil in 2008, 2009. And so it went up a lot, peaked uh, sort of mid-year 2008, and then absolutely collapsed, like down, I think, 50% or something. So I think that, I mean, if you want to stay long energy during a 50% collapse, I mean, demand just falls. So long term to me is 12 to 18 months. If demand, yeah, yeah. Yeah, if, the, if yeah. the economy sucks and yeah. demand falls, you know, the energy price is going to fall. Um, so simple as that. Got it. Makes sense. Okay. So we're going to do Mark Newman. And then on deck, uh, we got Chad. Mark, the floor is yours. Unmute yourself, please. Hey, guy. Hey, George. How are you? So Doing first, good. I apologize for not being on here sooner. So I might have missed some of uh, Michael's gospel. And I want to circle back to Michael in a minute. But I just want to mention, you know, re responding a little bit to Javier and the Fed. And here's what I start thinking about. It's August. Okay. We have a midterm election in what? Three months. OK. And prior to this, in the last couple of months, Biden's approval rate was in the basement as low as you could get almost. So I start to look at the actions that we're getting data point wise, Fed behavior wise. And look, you know, they're all sort of working together. And all of a sudden, Biden's on there every day talking. I got gas prices down 30 cents, 40 cents. Look at what I've done here. And then we just had a big numbers report, 520,000 or whatever, a lot of it part time. But again, it's part of the narrative. And so I think here in the near term, look, I hate to be all conspiracy and the rabbit hole and whatever, but people are sort of people. I say the authorities are, are working towards 
the midterms. All of a sudden, I saw in the last few days, maybe a week or two, that the odds of the, uh, the, on the Senate and the House have gotten much more favorable to the Democrats. And look, everybody, you know, it's funny. You talked or earlier, George, about Yellen saying the no recession story and all these folks are coming up. Michael said the fact checkers on Facebook. It's as if to be in the administration, you need to have a lobotomy before you can get in there. And so once, once you had that lobotomy, you can buy the story, buy the narrative and sell it accordingly. So I think that in the near term here, a lot of what we're seeing and hearing out of the Fed, out of the government is in, is in light of the coming midterm. So people can point to recent data and say, look what we've done. It's better than you think. We're doing better. So that's just one thought there on the Fed. Michael, I missed your early part, and I'm sorry. I'm going to have to go back and listen to the recording. But I wanted to check in with you. Last time I heard your gospel, there was a lot of talk about EPS troubles this time around. And I wondered how your models have reset, if you will, on the EPS uh, view right. because because it was it was a bit. It was a bit yeah, so New, Newman, Newman, Newman. I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll give Michael Belk on a rest. I'll make it easy for you. One hundred and seven dollars S and P earnings. Okay, that's where we're going. One hundred and seven dollars down over fifty percent. And Michael thinks the S and P is down fifty percent. Peak to drop before it's all over. So, okay, yeah. So my, Michael's in his forecast. You didn't. So I'll, I'll make it simple for you. All right, and then I'm. Let me just sneak in one more, Michael. Yep. Um, where are you on? Where are you on gold now in the sort of six to twelve months, or however what what your what your viewpoint is? Time horizon. That was, and now we're the, buy, buy signals, Mark. I, I, all right. I'm sorry. But, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have to go back and listen. Yeah, it was a re, is a real summary tour de force. Go back and go back. I'm and sure. Listen. I will. appreciate it. All right. Thanks, let's, George. Let's move on. So we got Chad with Nikoski is now in the on deck circle. Chad, welcome. Please unmute yourself. Hey guys, uh, thanks. I just caught the space earlier. It's the first time I've been on it. It's a great commentary so far. Uh, I was just had a, a point and then a question for Michael. So my, my point is not only is the VIX negative after the, the news today and the S&P within arm's reach of Chad, we're losing you. Chad, go meet yourself, please. I don't know where he went. Dave Dukoski, you there, Dave? Hey, I am. Thanks for having me on, George. Um, Belkin, great, great job. I completely agree with you. I'm not, I'm a technical analyst by trade. So, um, you know, obviously the charts are, are, you know, trying to, trying to bottom. And I would agree that, you know, it's probably a bear market rally. And, um, you know, some of the areas that we've been, you know, bullish on for the last several months have been biotechs. Um, we, didn't hit the energy call perfectly. We said we'd buy around the $93 mark is where we'd prefer it. Obviously, we've sunk through there. Um, you know, it, it seems to be multiple compression across the spectrum. Uh, I just posted a, a Twitter um, comment. You know, I saw a, uh, a baker in Germany, you know, shutting down their energy prices went from 900 euros a month to over 4,000. I don't see how anything in Europe can be made whatsoever. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the material stocks and, you know, I'm technically they're, they're, you know, it, it's like the things that are most oversold tend to bounce the most, the most, but, you know, looking at that, I would imagine Europe has everything completely shut down and, you know, they can't produce aluminum, zinc, nickel, anything. And, uh, you know, I know their con their consumption is not going to go to zero, but, you know, it seems like everything's shutting down. I'm watching, you know, I own some EWZ in Brazil, um, and, which is starting to turn, and I can't believe that we're not seeing inflections in the euro versus every emerging country um, in a bullish manner. I, again, I think Europe is done. Any thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, actually, great point. Um the sector rotation, um, which I follow very closely in Europe, I, for, the, I apply the model to the Eurostock 600 um, sectors, and yeah. it's really messed up. So basically, Germany is one gigantic auto manufacturing plant, right? Everything there yeah. is, is mostly related to autos or exporting industrial machinery, you know, things like that. Um, 
those stocks have held up. I mean, they're not at all time highs, but I, to me, in the model long term model forecast, you want to be short auto stocks, Volkswagen, Porsche. I know Porsche is doing an offering, but all these things, um, Solantis, the suppliers, um, industrial companies, Siemens. Um, I mean, that's just one example. There's, I have like 60 in my in my group in, uh, for industrial goods and services. Um, material stocks, there's a lot of uh, Scandinavian um, mining stocks, aluminum stocks, you know, Sweden, Norway. Um, these look extremely vulnerable, but they're, they've held up like in relative terms. Um, I just don't know what people are smoking, what investors. I, I went around actually in New York a month or two ago when I was there. <clears throat> I saw a prominent um, European investor and he said, oh, yeah, I, I'm, I showed him the forecast for auto stocks. He said, oh, I'm buying those. You know, those are great. I just don't get it. Like, like you said, it's it's basically going to shut down. You know, the the they're out. You know, whereas I'm bearish on crude oil globally and particularly in the U.S. It's a different picture in Europe, obviously, where they depend on natural gas supplies for the winter and for producing. You know, for running all those factories and everything. There's just you know, right now it looks like there's just not going to be enough, um, and it's going to be crippling. Um, you know, it's going to spread through all those it, it, cyclical stocks in Europe. So to me, they're screaming shorts and I don't understand why they're still up. It's not like they haven't, go, they haven't been going up, but they haven't gone down a whole lot yet. Same thing goes for banks, by the way. <clears throat> not, you know, it's not uh, European banks. They're not obviously industrials, but I think they're exposed. Their loan losses are going to go up. And even though they have from um, higher interest rates, they have better interest margins. Um, so European banks, negative. European industrials, negative. European materials, negative. European construction, negative. You know, it just keeps going down. And what do you buy in Europe? If you want to outperform, same stuff as here. Utilities, um, personal and household goods, uh, telecom stocks, kind of, they've, they've pulled back. These have you know, the the defensive stuff has pulled back in the last month or so, but they still have the long-term outperform forecast. So same thing, forecast for sector rotation in Europe as in the U.S., overweight defensive cell cyclicals. Hey, hey Michael, one, one question I could just add on, was, add on what Dave was asking. Um, you spoke about the, uh, the dollar. Currency is always a relative price. But I want to specifically not ask about the dollar, but I want to specifically ask about the euro. The euro, I mean, you know, whereas the yen's getting a little perky, it's starting to pick its head up a little bit. The euro is act has been acting really tra trading listlessly. And um, what does the euro look like to you, if anything? Um, okay, uh, so I do not have short dollar long euro yet. It could be approaching, and it sounds like buying garbage, doesn't it? I mean, I agree with you. You know, like what, why? And I, I have. A major, you know, billionaire family office client, and I have this conversation with them last few conference calls. It's like they say they're kind of scratching their heads, saying, "Why would you ever want to buy the euro? <laughs> it doesn't make sense to them." But um, it's, you know, what's the cleanest, dirtiest shirt in the bunch? You know, so if if the U.S. economy goes down the tubes, and and so one thing that could make the euro rally although i'm not there yet in the forecast is they're behind on raising interest rates so um whereas the fed has raised what you know like 200 basis points or something so far you know almost 150 200 basis points the ecb has done hardly anything so they've got more catching up to do um so that could be beneficial to the euro um let me change the subject though the yen okay Japanese yen, which we've talked about in the past on these spaces, I have dollar yen as a short. So I am long the yen. New position this week. Um, it topped out, I think, really shorted. Um, and it kind of goes into global, you know, turmoil. It's one of those things people, they say, quote unquote, it's a safe haven, the yen. Um, but but uh, I just think the dollar is topping. And I wouldn't be surprised if I have the euro as a long in within a few weeks' time. Right now, it's more like the Swiss franc, yen, um, things like that. Right. That's great. Uh, by the way, just before, before our next uh, question from uh, Philip, I uh, just, just, uh, just want to point out, I've had a number of inquiries from people in the room in the space. 
if you're interested in Michael's work, and again, I have no commercial relationship with Michael. I don't benefit from his work at all. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I pass along his wisdom, and I have him in these spaces just because I think he's one of the best guys out there, and, and I've benefited enormously from following his work over the decades. And he has a product, um, kind of sounds like a Jerry Lewis telephone here, uh, the Belkin Light Report, which is a fraction of the cost of the uh, institutional product, which runs tens of thousands of dollars. This is incredibly affordable. Um, it's it's really, you know, you can pay for it in a week, basically, if you just follow his advice, you get it right. And so I put up in the nest, if you're interested, um, there's, a, there's a, I put a tweet up there, uh, at Hyperpron, uh, that's his uh, colleague, um, uh, Mark, um, who's standing by to take your orders. No, but seriously, if you want to take Michael's uh, service, um, he's offering, as he does from time to time, he comes in these spaces, a discount. Um, I think Mark was talking about it's going to expire um, for only two hours after the spaces, but I'll twist his arm and he's going to kill me for saying this. Um, I'm, I'm invoking an executive order that, that that discount's probably good till midnight tonight. So, um, you know, call now, call, call, call direct, but call now. But no, but seriously, um, you know, I, I can't recommend his service strongly enough. So uh, I want to get that out there. Okay, so now we go to Philip, and then after Philip, we're going to get Chad back in here. Philip, good to see you. Please unmute yourself. Philip? Hey, George. Thanks a lot. Um, great hearing your perspective, Michael. So, you know, George, George put up the uh, fantastic quote from Walter Diemer, right, that that the stock market's going to do whatever it needs to to, to humble the, the greatest number of people. And so, you know, in, in that context, I always think about how, how could I be wrong? And I think I'm, I'm almost as bearish as, as George and, and some of the other folks, you know, in the community. But when I think about what could make me or, you know, us collectively wrong, I think about, I think about Russia and China in this sort of, you know, this alliance they've formed and then the the massive sort of corporate industrial production that has to come out of China. Right. And so I'm, I, I have really two questions. One is how does your model uh, incorporate those, you know, sort of unknowns and what do you think about Apple, right? So much of their supply chain is highly dependent on China. If China were to, you know, become kinetic or, um, you know, intensify their threats towards Taiwan you know, that's a huge unknown. So I'm just curious um, how, how you think about that and, and a lot of industrial production coming back west, either to U.S., Canada, Mexico. Okay, good question. Um, so I have to sort of differentiate between what the model says and then, you know, I wear two hats. I wear the, the econometric hat and the market strategist hat. Um, so all I can say is China down, China looks like it's headed lower. Chinese stocks in the U.S. headed lower. You asked about Apple. I have Fang as a, I still have Fang as a top 10 sell short recommendation. Apple's bounced a lot. Yeah. Um, now, so that's on the, that's the econometric hat. All that stuff's supposed to go down. Now, quant qualitatively, you know, here's the investment strategist hat. Um, I totally agree with you. And I kind of mentioned this before. I think we're really exposed to major problems in China and all these companies like Tesla, right? Apple with huge production facilities there, General Motors. If these if things start getting nasty and the sanctions start flying, again, it's not necessarily the conflict. It's when these things start getting sanctions. And then, you know, I mean the Chinese don't want to cut their own throat because they are, you know, they've got a lot of workers working in these plants and, um, you know, Apple production plants, et cetera, Tesla. Um, however, you know, things can get nasty and pu Chinese public opinion is really gone hugely warlike. If you read the, what they're saying about Taiwan, you know, they say shoot down your plane, Pelosi's plane, you know, they're saying stuff like that. So the, the Chinese public, uh, you know, if you get sentiment turning against the U.S., then they could start boycotting, you know, Teslas and Apples. I mean, that's that's a real risk. And I'm not crazy for saying that. You know, you see others. Uh, I have one of the things I do in the report is press clips. And I put a press clip in this week's report about on this same exact subject where um, Western corporations 
are starting to war game, you know, think about strategizing what they are going to do um, if conflict between China and the U.S. escalates because they are horribly exposed. And I mean, it's deeper than that even. So think about we've we've been living from all this globalization, making cheap stuff and shipping it over here, you know, buying in Walmart. It's subsidized our standard of living for decades, right? I mean, that's been the whole, the only game in town. If that starts blowing up, yeah, they can move the factories from China to Bangladesh or Vietnam or something, but that doesn't happen overnight. So I think the whole kind of global globalism thing is very vulnerable and um, to conflict eroding commercial relationships, you know, um, things that make sense to companies all of a sudden get sideswiped by political and um, potentially even military conflict and the consequences of sanctions. So I, I'm on, I, I'm on, I think we're on the same page on that. That's a great yeah. question, Philip. Thanks for that. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Philip. Chad, floor is yours. Please don't unmute yourself, Chad. I know you got cut off before. Chad? Floor is yours, Chad. Yeah, I'm here. Can you guys hear me okay this time? Yeah, we got it. We're good. We're okay. good. Okay, thanks and sorry about that. Uh, I just had a point and then a question for Michael. And Michael, thanks for, for joining on. And by the way, uh, thanks for holding this. Uh, uh, also, George, it's the first time I've been on it. It's a great commentary. Uh, I was going to point out that on the credit markets that, I mean, not only did you have a continued, um, or I guess you're within arm's re reach of positive territory in the S&P and the VIX is negative now. It looks like based on yield movement and the price of HYG that credit spreads uh, contracted again today, So, which just seems uh, insane to me. It's like a complete narrative flip. Um, and that I don't know how much of it has to do with you know, the high yield market has essentially become a proxy of HYG and the other big ETFs, but crazy. Um, anyways, uh, the question for you, Michael, is that and apologize if you addressed this earlier, but it seems like a cornerstone of a lot of the underlying uh, rate arguments is what's the the long term inflation rate, and has it structurally changed? And so, uh, how if you haven't, <clears throat> or if you have already uh, went through this, could you repeat it and give me your quick summary of thoughts? It sounds like you may have some views given your uh, points that you just addressed, us on the global front, and the supply chains, et cetera. Sure. Um, okay. I my model has CPI rate of change peaking. Same thing PPI. Um, that doesn't mean inflation is going down right away. It just means it's a peak now. So um, I think it's enough to keep uh, pressure on the Fed to keep raising rates. And um, it, so it's kind of a bifurcated thing though, because energy's down, you know, twenty percent. Base metals down 20 plus percent. So the PPI kind of things that created the surge of inflation originally, they've already turned south and, they're and grains, same thing. So it's kind of a slow motion process of the reaction to stimulus. It all has to do, I mean, why do we have inflation? We have inflation because of $9.5 trillion of stimulus. There's no more stimulus. And now we're just kind of coasting. It's sort of like, you know, Wiley Coyote going off the cliff with his his legs are still spinning. So I, I don't expect inflation to fall. Um, I It keeps getting fed in. If you look at the uh, intermediate term and services and stuff, you know, companies are still padding, raising prices and things. So it's hard to eliminate. And, and on that side, I guess I agree with Powell and what he's saying. You know, it's you you have to they have to affect the the inflationary psychology. So, um, but um, the, uh, but beneath the surface, the 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 fundamental stuff that made inflation go up is over. So peaking, it's not. It'll probably take a while before um, it, you know we see a a headline CPA CPI. That decline. So it's just basically in the process of peaking at the moment. Um, later on, so where are we now? August. Um, I would say it's next year, late this year, early next year, declining CPI, um, declining PPI. And instead of people talking about inflation, they'll be talking about deflation. Understood. Thank you for your thoughts. Okay. So, um, Jackson. Hello, my friend. Are you in... Uh... South Beach, what's going on, Jackson? Floor is yours, Jackson. Please unmute yourself. Jackson, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're still there or not. All right. Um, 
So with that, we are an hour and 45 min- minutes into this. Michael, this is really, really so appreciated that you're back. It's only I think it was only been like six weeks since you were here last, uh, five, six weeks. This is terrific. You've been so spot on. Uh, you know, Mark's had a bit of a rally here. We'll see. But your energy call, for which you were much maligned, uh, was uh, you know, truly on point. And it's good to have a mark to market here. Again, uh, if you're interested in the Belkin Light Report, um, it's up in the nest. Uh, or you can look at uh, at Hyperpron or at Belkin Report uh, for more information uh, about Michael Service. Terrific, terrific uh, service, service, well worth it. Um, so with that, Michael, I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone, KFAB, Mark Newman, uh, Philip, etc. It's been a fantastic room. We continue to have the best rooms on Twitter, best spaces on Twitter, period. Just just look at this room. I mean, it's unbelievable. Um, and we're going to have a couple of great spaces next week. Next Monday, we have Vitaly, um, uh, my friend Vitaly, um, who's a terrific value investor in Denver, coming on 8 p.m. Eastern on, on, on Monday. Yeah, Monday, not Tuesday. On Monday. And then next Thursday, um, Edward Chancellor, really smart guy, um, uh, written a new book. Uh, for those, those you probably know, one of his other previous books, Double Take the uh, Double Take the, the the Hind Post, I think it was, or Hindmost, whatever. Um, he's come out with a new bo- with a new book, the the, uh, the the Price of Time. And Michael, you have to read this book. He just throws um, all the central uh, banksters under the bus. Huge. So I think you're really going to like it. But that's 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, I believe, uh, next uh, next Thursday. So it's in my Twitter feed. Anyway, this has been a great room, really great room. Michael, I hope you'll come back again. It's been awesome. KFAB, always a pleasure. Newman, Jackson, etc. And with that, we're going to close this room. This has been awesome. Uh, and everyone have a great weekend. Take care, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks, George. Bye.